Hello, I'm Phil Pan Baker, and today I want to demonstrate the Mathematical Mesh. The Mathematical Mesh is a cryptographic infrastructure that is designed to make computers more secure without requiring users to go to additional effort. So why is that important? Well, over the past 30 odd years that the internet has uh, been a major infrastructure, we've got pretty good at securing data in motion. Uh, TLS, or as it used to be called SSL, has successfully prevented criminals from extracting credit card numbers from internet packets as they're flying over the internet itself. So why do we still have a security problem? Well, the problem is that we haven't really solved the problem of securing data at rest. And to understand why that is a problem, despite the existence of encryption, let me just show you how en the ex user experience for encryption today. So let's just bring up the script for this presentation in uh, Microsoft Word. And I have encrypted it with uh, a password. Okay, so Word has had password encryption for files for uh, you know decades now. They use AES encryption. Yes, I know that passwords are pretty weak security. You choose a weak password. Your security is not going to be weak, very good. But you know, why don't people encrypt their Excel files and their Word files even with the uh, poor weeks passwords. Well, it's too much hassle. I'm opening up this uh, document. What password did I use to encrypt it? Well, the only way that I can possibly remember is if I use the same password for every document, which isn't going to work. And then if I come back to this document in 10, 20 years time, I've probably forgotten it. So I've lost my work because I tried to think about security. Uh, so Yes, I can get to it now, but that's not an acceptable user experience. What would be an acceptable user experience for data at rest, for strong encryption? Well, we know what it is. It's this. I open up the uh, file. Oh. oh, yeah, and it gives you a, a, a little idiot box to complain about. You've changed the file. No, I didn't. I just entered a password. I didn't change that file at all, but I had some friction there because I had dared to use security. The fact that I was using security was getting in my way of doing my work. So what should it look like? It should look exactly like this. I want to open up my file. It's encrypted, but I don't have to think. I have, don't have to do anything more to use it securely. That's how Signal works. That's how WhatsApp works. That's how any of the new generation of cryptographic applications work. Like TLS, they provide security, strong security, without the user being required to think about security. And if you're not providing that zero effort security, you're not going to get anywhere. So the heart of the mesh is providing end-to-end -end security of data at rest with zero effort. Okay, so how do we get there? Well, it's a large infrastructure. It's about the same size as PKIX X509, which is the backing infrastructure for the web PKI that uh, supports TLS. Um, it's taken me three years to develop the code. And today I'm going to be doing three uh, separate demonstrations. The first one, which if all you want to look at is to see how is this going to affect me as a user when it's available, uh, you can skip, is going to show you how we configure a mesh service and show you that that is really easy and simple. Because you know, at the end of the day, if I can't persuade system administrators to install mesh services so that their users can make use of it, well, they're not going to be using the mesh, are they? Um, this was one of the big lessons we learned in the World Wide Web at CERN, 
The reason that the web took off, where many of its actually rather better um, competitors like Hyperg and so on didn't, was that users could deploy the web without being having to be a system administrator and without having to write a large check to uh, the Hyperg people to get a license. And yes, before I go any further, the mesh is completely open. It's open source. The reference code is MIT licensed, so you can take my code and build it into a product. If you, and, and that's, let's face it, that's the only way that we're going to get security built into the internet is if there is an open infrastructure that anybody can plug into that application without having to pay for an additional license. So it's open source, open, uh, open specifications, and open service. This is not like Signal where the code is open, but it'll only work against the proprietary service, and that proprietary service won't tell to any other messaging service. No, for me, open means open, and this is open. Okay, so in the first presentation, I'm going to be showing you the service, and the second one, I'm going to be showing you how the mesh, Alice can use the mesh to solve her own personal security problems. And then finally, I'm going to be showing how Alice and Bob can use the mesh together to secure their communications and their interactions. So if all you want to do is to see the user experience, you can skip ahead from this point on, you've got my permission, and maybe come back later on to see what the system administration uh, experience is going to be. But because I've got to show this how to configure a service before I can use it, I got to go in chronological order. Okay, so let's see how configuring the system looks like from the point of view of the system administrator. So first things first, just so that we've got a checkpoint and we know which version of the software we're using, let's just take a look. This is a command line tool, of course, because you know, if you're a system administrator, that's pretty much what uh, is easiest for you. So it's version 1.0.0.23. Uh, it was compiled a few days ago, and this is very close to what will be the alpha release of the uh, mesh tool. Uh, I've made a couple of chain improvements since, but uh, it, it's pretty much the same as the root alpha release. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is to create a a mesh service. And to do that, we've got to give it a few bits of information. So first thing we've got to do is to give it the name by which this service is going to be visible to the outside world. Since this is an example, I'm going to use the um, IETF reserved DNS name for examples, which is example.com. Um, and the reason you have to specify this, of course, is that this host could be bound to dozens of different DNS names. So you need to tell it which, uh, what the name of the service is going to be because it may well be different. Next thing we've got to do is to give it the name by which this host will be used for, will be referred to for configuration purposes. And as you're probably familiar with, um, management of mail or whatever. We usually keep the two separate these days. Next, we have to give it the external IP address by which external um, hosts are going to, uh, external clients are going to connect to this service, which we will need, uh, I'll show you why we need that in a little while. Um, now, since this is a demonstration, I'm going to use a private IP address that's non-routable, but in a real example, this would be our real IP address that's uh, visible from the external world. And I'm also going to specify the port number. And finally, I'm going to tell it to create an administrator account. There are no defaults built into this system. Uh, so we've got to give it a name. I'm going to give it the name admin at example.com, but it could be anything. It's 
So just check that I've got everything right. And it's going to go away and think and create a lot of cryptography underneath the covers. In this demonstration, I'm only going to be showing you the what. In later uh, presentations, I'll show you the how and the why, because there's actually a lot of crypto that has happened. Uh, we've not just created one key pair like you might expect, like you used to configure a TLS uh, service uh, for your web server. It's actually created uh, roughly a dozen keys for different purposes. And the reason that we use so many of these keys is that each key provides a degree of freedom for solving problems on the user's behalf, or in this case, the system administrator's behalf. So I'll explain in a later uh, video why we have so much. But as you can see, we've got uh, what look like two PGP fingerprints here, one for the service and one for the, the host running under the service. Now, at the moment, the software only supports one host per service. It doesn't support multiple hosts, but the architecture has been designed from the start so that you can uh, have a dozen server machines supporting a single service. Uh, and obviously that's essential for scalability, but uh, at this point we've got zero users. Uh, we're not going to be in the tens of thousands within the next few weeks, so we can do that separation. Uh, we can make things simpler. Okay. So these look like PGP fingerprints. They have a very similar purpose, but there are two major differences. One, they're base 32 encoded instead of being base 16. And that just allows us to squeeze one more bit into each character of the fingerprint. And the second thing is that the first two characters, uh, the first byte of the fingerprint, uh, specifies the digest algorithm used in the fingerprint. So that provides for um, cryptographic algorithm uh, portability. So that if we change the algorithm in the future, uh, we, we can and the fingerprints won't collide. Uh, at the moment, SHA-2 and SHA-3 are the only algorithms that are specified, both at 512 bit strength. And the, uh, the identifier has been chosen so that neither will collide with a PGP fingerprint. Number one, they'll always start with either an M for Merkel Damgard, which for SHA-2, which is a Merkel Damgard construction, and uh, K for SHA-3, which is uh, Kekak, uh, was the original uh, code name for it. So we've created our service. Uh, so let's take a look at the files we created. And they're not in this directory, of course, because we've populated those files to the place where the platform that we're on, in this case, it's a Windows box, uh, but it, the code will also run on Linux or Mac, or at least Microsoft.net uh, team promises me that it will, uh, and I believe them. Um, if we were on the Linux or the Mac box, it would populate those files out to where Linux or Mac uh, would expect to find them for a service. Uh, so where have they gone? Well, uh, we can actually uh, check with the tool, uh, rather than play the usual game of where did we hide those files, which usability people seem to insist on us playing. Uh, you know, anybody try to use uh, Windows Fax recently? Uh, it'll scan your uh, file, no problem, but then you spend uh, 10 minutes trying to find which directory it's been so, so stored in. Okay, so we've got uh, two directories here, one for the keys, um, which if the platform has a secure key store, the keys will be stored under that secure key store and locked uh, using whatever uh, facilities are available to that platform. And here we've got the profile directory. Let's just take a look at that. And as you can see, we've got a whole bunch of uh, information, some to do with the host, some to do with the service. Uh, I'm just going to take a look at one of those files. 
and that's meshservice.json. That's the JSON configuration file for the service. Let's just take a, a quick peek. Um, okay, and as you can see here, we've got uh, just a standard JSON configuration file. Uh, this is in the format that .NET generic host has developed. Um, and so if you're familiar with configuring .NET generic host um, uh, services, you'll be familiar with this format. Otherwise, it's reasonably uh, simple. And here we have a, a configuration for the service. And here we have a second separate uh, configuration for our first host. And we can um, introduce as many hosts as we need, uh, add them with the sysadmin tool at a later date when that's supported, whatever. And here we have uh, a part that uh, is talking about the logging options. And this bit here is simply our standard .NET logging to the console, which we're going to be using in this demonstration. And here we have DARE logging format. Well, what, what's DARE about? Well, DARE stands for Data at Rest Envelope, and it is a cryptographic envelope uh, security format for storing encrypted data. It's one of the core formats of the mesh. And in this case, we're using it to store uh, encrypted log file. Uh, so unlike uh, traditional log files uh, where you just write it out to the uh, host and so anybody who comes along can then see what uh, anybody who has access to the host can see uh, who has been talking to it all that crucial metadata is stored and encrypted uh, by default uh, in this case we encrypt our log files by default uh, to, uh, in this case, it's the uh, authorized recipient who has a decryption key is admin at example.com. And this is where they will be stored. I'm going to delete that there. And it's for the same reason that we can't use uh, encryption in Word. And that is encryption is easy, decryption is hard. Well, the mesh decryption tools work, but um, they're not really up to handling a decrypt an encrypted log file without decrypting the whole thing at the moment. So uh, we'll just uh, get rid of that for the time being. Okay, so we've done our configuration now. And so there's two more things we need to do before we can start our service. The first is we've got to configure this platform. So it ha the service has the exact correct privileges so they can run the service. And secondly, we need to configure the external DNS. So how do we do that? Well, the service, this is where the mesh approach is different. Traditionally, we just tell the, you know, the service provider just tells the sysadmin, oh, and now configure your DNS and your host. And they're just left to uh, cope with themselves. No, well, we know how we have to configure the host because we have to test it on it. So let's just write out their configuration file. So here we have, uh, we, we give the uh, service in the Netshare uh, command, and that will write out our Windows configuration file. And here you can see it is setting up a URL a ACL, uh, and giving some sort of permission over this uh, URL. Well, what's going on here is the mesh is designed to be a least privilege system. And so you're not going to run a mesh service as root. You're going to run it in a separate account that is only for that mesh service. So here we have voodoo admin. And we're going to run it with the absolute minimum uh, permissions required. And in this case, we because we're running on the Windows platform and because the web server is built into the Windows platform, we, we give permission to specific uh, 
um, users or accounts to bind to specific portions of the HTTP URI uh, web space. And that's called a web service endpoint. And so that's what's going on here. So what this is allowing us to achieve is to uh, absolutely minimize our, um, our privileges. Okay, so now I need to, now I can't execute that in this account because uh, doing that would, uh, you know, it's the least privilege. Uh, I have to go to a system and administration account. So let's just uh, get ourselves into that. Okay, so I could copy the batch file across, but I'm just going to cut and paste because uh, it's only one line. And so I've reserved that um, web service endpoint. And now uh, there's just one more thing I need to do, which is create my DNS configurations. And let's just... Uh... So here we have a standard uh, DNS configuration file in the uh, bind uh, format. And as you can see, it's creating a, declaring a service here uh, for type MMM, that's reserved uh, SRV uh, prefix for the mesh. Uh, so mesh on TCP at example.com. Um, there's one host specified, host1.example.com, and here's the port number. So this is the information that we gave when we created the service. And uh, that's why we gave all that information and put it all in the uh, JSON configuration file. Because if we have a single point at which we configure the service, there's much less uh, chance of um, mistakes uh, being introduced when we uh, configure it uh, for production use. Now, I'm not going to uh, put that onto my DNS server now because I've already uh, configured it. Um, here's the service description. Here's the host example.com. Uh, they're both uh, specified in my DNS. Uh, there's two more pieces of information here, which are the um, fingerprint of the service uh, as a prefix text record. And here is the fingerprint of the host as a prefixed uh, text record. So what's that going on here? Well, this is DNS service discovery statements that are telling a uh, client that is using DNS to discover this service, what the roots of trust are for the host and for the service as a whole. And if we then sign our zone with DNSSEC, that's a way that we're providing a secure means of publishing a security policy for that zone because we've given it the root of trust under which the sec all security assertions are going to be uh, published. So it's a small issue, but it it's all a matter of getting the um, getting the steps done right, getting everybody to do them the same, and then you get more consistency in the configuration of the service and hopefully more, more reliability as a result. Okay, so we've done all the stuff that we need to, all the configuration, we need to start the service. And now all we need to do is to tell it to start. And this is a separate ho uh, tool called Mesh Host. Again, same version. And now let's just tell it to start. And that started the uh, HTTP listener on uh, the web service endpoint that we declared. And that's just going to run and tell us each time a client, client attempts to connect. Okay, to recap, in this presentation, I've shown how to configure a mesh service, which is something that users would hopefully never need to do for themselves. Um, 
unless they really want to run their own mesh service. Uh, I've shown how we use mesh fingerprints as roots of trust in uh, for describing the roots of trust for the host and for the service. And I've shown you how the configuration of the service uh, is used to generate all the platform and uh, network configuration files that are need to uh, configure the service, uh, needed to start the service. In the next presentation, I'm going to show you the use of the mesh itself and how Alice can use the mesh to provide Alice with security. Thank you for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and please uh, join me for the next uh, podcast, which is how Alice uses the mesh to secure the mesh her data. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for giving me your time. Please like, please subscribe, and please consider giving some of your time to the Mathematical Mesh Project. We don't just need developers, we need people to try out the code and see if it meets real people's needs. Over the past 20 years, internet security has mostly got worse rather than better. It reminds me of the Lorax at the end where all the trees have been cut down and the what was once a paradise has been turned into a barren landscape. And the old Wansler says that things aren't going to improve unless somebody cares a lot. And a few years ago, I realized that maybe I had to be that person. Maybe I was the one who had to care. And I spent the past three years mostly working alone, developing this code. It's not going to take effect without a movement, without other people deciding that they care a lot and that they want to help change the web, change the internet for the better. The mesh might not be the final answer to internet insecurity, but I do think, at the very least, it is a proof of concept that we can do much better than we're doing today. Thank you for watching.